So good evening and welcome. I'm going to go ahead and get us started because we have a very full program. Welcome to Ebola and Beyond, sponsored by the Center for Health Innovation at Adelphi University. And thank you to each of you for braving the weather and for taking the time to tune in. We have universities in Washington, from New York to Washington, who are tuning into this live stream event, and we welcome people uh, who are tuning in as well. So I'm Elizabeth Cohen, and I have the privilege of directing the Center for Health Innovation, which is an interdisciplinary sector that focuses on health, broadly defined. So it's not just the absence of disease or illness, but rather a constellation of factors, economic, social, political, ecologic, cultural, and physical, that comprise healthy, high-quality lives for commun communities and individuals. And this event is part of our rapid response mechanism, which helps us uh, broaden the dialogue for, around public health to um, current events in public health. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, the president of Adelphi University, Dr. Robert Scott, Provost Gail Insler, and Associate Provost Audrey Blumberg. And I also want to take a moment to thank my staff, Ms. Megan McPherson and Ms. Audrey Onderdonk, who helped put this event together. So thank you so much to them. To provide context and background, I want to welcome a professor and author of Dread, of Dread how fear and fantasy have fueled ep epidemics from the Black Death to the avian flu, uh, Professor Philip Alcabis to the podium, who will introduce uh, and set context for the program. And that will be followed by Dr. Samuel Stanley, the president of Stony Brook University, who will also moderate our panel discussion. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Alcabis to do the context, and then I'll come back and introduce the panel. Greetings, welcome to Adelphi. Oops. I'm really short, so I'm All right, I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do, but you can hear me, I think. Um, so, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks, to President Scott, for inviting me and distinguished guests. Uh, can't hear you. Can't hear you. How's that? Yeah. Better? All right, I might have to hold this. Try that. Uh, I've been asked to offer public health context for this forum on Ebola and preparedness. I wish I could be upbeat about public health right now, but I fear that the fact that all of us are here tonight is a sign of impending trouble in public health, a sign that the great endeavor of public health, protecting the health of the collective, of all of us, through hazard remediation and social improvement has been replaced by a campaign for anxiety reduction, a campaign of magical narratives of preparedness and risk reduction. Esteemed panelists, you may consider yourself, yourselves challenged. Challenged to explain not how we're ready for Ebola, since frankly that's a moot point, but how we may become ready to face the real threats to the public's health how we're going to face the threat to America, America's health, posed by inescapable poverty, gross inequality of opportunity, and the terrible divergence of the health of the world's wealthy from that of the poor. In the 19th century, enlightened Americans realized that everyone's health depends on the health of the poor. The Gold Coast and the slum were too close together, in the words of one historian. Can you be, can we be, equally enlightened in looking at today's world. As for Ebola, I think everyone here knows that Ebola is not a public health crisis in America. Ebola virus is not infectious except by direct context, contact with a person who is seriously ill from uh, the infection. It's an occupational safety issue for nurses and other caregivers, yes, absolutely, but it's not a crisis for the American public. Ebola is a public health crisis in Western Africa. If there's a real crisis in America about Ebola, it's that we aren't tremendously interested in Western Africa or most of the poor world. The fact that you and I, that we're all here this evening, reassuring ourselves that we're ready for Ebola, that we need not be frightened of Ebola, which is, of course, 
um, a way of reassuring ourselves that we were quite, quite right to have been frightened of Ebola, that Americans' panic was justified, or that it wasn't really panic, that the media had just blown it out of proportion, or it was just the sort of normal fear that leads governors to quarantine nurses, or forbid scientists to fly into the state of Louisiana for conferences. Um, as if it weren't we, consumers of media, who were reading the newspapers and watching the TV news avidly, that we're having this confab over our own agitation, I mean, is exactly what makes me fearful about the future of public health. And this isn't about any alleged rejection of science. I'm not talking about that. It's not getting science isn't public health's problem, not right now. now. The demise of public health, if it happens, has to do with a failure of our institutions. Americans have lost faith with the grand project of public health. The Ebola panic in America is both evidence of the loss of faith and a reason to further mistrust our institutions. The public health project, that project that brought you sewage disposal, clean drinking water, safer workplaces, polio-free kids, inspected beef, and contraception, and also wiped America clean of smallpox and cholera, iodide deficiency, goiter and rickets, typhoid, pellagra, I could go on, um, is the project that's in danger. To ask whether Americans have lost faith in public health because the zeitgeist has shifted away from all sorts of institutions, or if it's part of the takeover of public consciousness by Google, or if government has really let us down, that would take more time than I've got, although it would be fascinating. But clearly, we in the health sector are part of the problem. With Ebola, public health leaders did not urge that American resources be devoted to ending the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa in the spring and early summer of this year. Nor had they ever urged that American resources be devoted to creating infrastructure and programs in the poor countries of the world so as to reduce vulnerability and limit suffering. And, not incidentally, to quickly tamp down outbreaks that might go on to affect the rest of the world. President Obama has, just yesterday, finally asked Congress to appropriate $6 billion to respond to Ebola um, in, in Africa. But it's late, and still, public health officials have never espoused the public health truth. The health of the wealthy depends on health for the poor. What our officials have done for over a decade now is promote incessantly a rhetoric of preparedness, a preparedness crusade that has said to the public that America is in constant danger, and that only by taking exceptional measures at home, extra surveillance, no-fly lists, training exercises, and so forth, can we hope to be safe that we Americans are actually healthier than ever after generations of public health improvements is impertinent, it seems. The constant state of emergency counts on eliding any distinctions between facts and fears. So it's reasonable to ask, given the state of emergency, why should Americans trust their health, our health, to our institutions? The Ebola panic, then, isn't really about Ebola. It's a panic about a crisis in the polity a failure of the public to own up to what makes us healthy, a failure of public health agencies to win the public's confidence, a failure of officials, researchers, teachers like me to stand up and say that the world is not out of control, although it has its dangers, that viral outbreaks like Ebola happen, but they can be dealt with, and above all, that America's health is everybody's health. Thanks. So much, and that was a, a, a fabulous scene to set. And we appreciate uh, your candor and you starting this dialogue um, in such an honest and open way. I'd like to now introduce Dr. St uh, Sam Stanley, who's the president of Stony Brook University. He earned his medical degree at Harvard, completed a residency at Massachusetts General, and a fellowship at the Washington University in Seattle, where he became a professor of medicine and molecular microbiology. He's a highly distinguished biomedical researcher and one of the nation's highest recipients of support from the National Institute of Health with research that focuses on enhanced defense against emerging infectious disease. 
He is currently the chair of the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, which assures the safe conduct of biodefense research. After he speaks, he will moderate a panel discussion uh, featuring Dr. Donna Armolino, Dr. Ruben Pasternak, uh, Dr. Vincent Politi, Dr. Lawrence Eisenstein, and doc Dr. Barry Rosenthal. So I'll come and introduce each of those um, after he speaks. Welcome, Dr. Stanford. So thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. It, it's really a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, the opening statement, actually. I, I think it was very thought-provoking. But in fact, uh, as you're going to hear from what I'm going to talk about today, I, I really agree uh, with a number of those messages. And most importantly, this concept that global health is America's health. And we do not have the ability nowadays to separate uh, what's going on, whether it's West Africa, uh, Asia, whatever part of the world it is, we can no longer make a separation and think that we're safe because of geography or anything else. What's happening in those countries does have a major impact on our country, and I think we have to have a health policy um, that reflects that. Um, so it's great to be here. I'm going to, uh, and, and great to be in Adelphi. I wanted to, to reach out to my colleague, uh, Dr. Robert Scott, my esteemed colleague. Again, thank you so much for having me here. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, I think, try and make three points. So the first point I'm going to make is, is really something um, that I think uh, uh, Dr. Alcabas made uh, before me, which is there is a threat for infectious diseases. I think there's a continuing threat for infectious diseases around the world, and I'll talk about that, and why I think not just the United States, but the world has to be vigilant, and a global health policy is necessary to protect us. So that's going to be point number one. The second point then is I'm going to talk about Ebola. And I don't know if, you know, some of you in the audience may be old enough to remember the old show Dragnet, you know, where they would talk to people and they'd say, just the facts, ma'am. Well, I'm going to try to just deliver just the facts uh, about Ebola tonight, the things that we know from science, the science of Ebola. And then we'll have time to talk about speculation and other things at some point in time. But I really do want to stick to factual components about that. It's a very interesting disease from a scientific point of view, but also, as we know, a very devastating one. And then the last part, I just want to talk a little bit about the drugs that are now available and the therapies and put those in the context of the investment that you made uh, as taxpayers uh, in preparedness and readiness for Ebola. Again, not just for the U.S., uh, but for the world. Um, after 9-11, there was a significant investment made uh, in supporting research on these kind of rare emerging infections like Ebola. There was work done on anthrax, as you know, on smallpox and others. But that really did set up an infrastructure we've never had before. And I want to talk about how that really did put us in a much better position to deal with Ebola than we would have been without it. And it's a reminder that your tax dollars made a difference, but it's also a reminder that we need to continue to make that kind of investment. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, in the late 60s, uh, the Surgeon General of the United States, William Stewart, said it was time to close the book on infectious diseases. We had basically won the war on pestilence, it was over, and we wouldn't have any more problems with infectious diseases. Um, we know that was dead wrong, absolutely dead wrong. Um, we have, there was reason to have optimism at that time, but looking back, I can understand it. As was mentioned, we, have errat we had eradicated smallpox which unquestionably is one of the major accomplishments really for humanity, uh, was the eradication of smallpox. We had done that. We had some effective vaccines against other diseases, polio, measles, several other diseases. Unfortunately, we have not yet eradicated those infections, but we had the tools back then and people thought it was on the horizon. And then we had effective antibiotics against many of the bacteria uh, that plague us, as well as the beginning of some antivirals. And I think people felt we would be able to control or eliminate these infections. But as I said before, that was totally and completely wrong. And in fact, since that time, and this slide may be hard for you to read, but since that time, we've had a number of outbreaks uh, that have occurred. And the most prominent, of course, uh, is human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, uh, which, as you can see from this slide, uh, has infected 78 million people uh, around the world, has killed 39 million. Um, that epitomizes 
the concept of a newly emerging infectious disease. It probably came because of human contact, essentially, uh, with infected uh, animals, so an encroachment, essentially, uh, of what had been a cycle that may have involved non-human primates that then spread into humans, and then became was transmissible between humans and resulted in an epidemic that then was able to spread because of the much much greater ability now uh, for people to travel, essentially, and really this flat world, which I'll talk more about in a second. We've had other epidemics since then. Everybody remembers, I think, SARS uh, back in 2003, which created some of the same types of concerns that Ebola has today, but in some sense was a little more threatening, I think, as, as I look at it from an infectious disease point of view, because of its mode of transmission, which involves respiratory transmission, which put things at risk, and not shown up there and really talked about is the continued risk from influenza. So we have swine flu up there, uh, the more recent epidemic of influenza, but influenza remains a tremendous threat. And we've seen strains like H5N1 that pose a threat. That to me represents still the largest threat that the world faces right now from infectious diseases is a new strain of influenza that would be comparable to 1918. That will not kill tens of millions of people, that could kill hundreds of millions of people, and that's really what the 1918 epidemic did. So the threat from infectious diseases remains. And one of the reasons I mentioned is that biosecurity infectious diseases really know no borders. As we have continued kind of to expand in areas, and again, Ebola is an example of this, and I'll talk about it more in a second. As we've gone in areas where people used to not live, we've entered into, uh, into environmental life cycles that have introduced viruses back into humans uh, with potentially devastating results. We continue to expand. Our species continues to expand. It's bringing us into contact with microbes that pose a threat. The second one, and the one that I think is really most important, is of course microbes are evolving all the time. And every, anybody ever asked me, you know, well, you know, what about evolution? Well, you know, anybody who works in infectious disease works with evolution all the time. Microbes are evolving all the time. Um, they, they, they replicate their DNA, they replicate their RNA in their cases with many error-prone ways, which means there's lots of mutation, which means there's lots of ability for them to evolve and change. And we see this all the time, and there are real examples where viruses, for example, have changed host specificity. And SARS was probably one of them, where it began as a virus that may have affected bats, may have affected civet cats, but then changed the specificity this coronavirus changed, so it can now infect humans and led to the epidemic of SARS that we saw before. So viral mutation leads to those kind of problems. Bacterial mutation leads to the antibiotic resistance I talked about. We give antibiotics, we select for bacteria that are resistant to those antibiotics, and then we have to try and develop new ways to deal with them. This is a cycle we're going to continue to face. And the third thing is what I alluded to before. Um, there's no islands anymore. The oceans are no longer any protection. We have jet planes. Ebola pointed that out to us uh, in a very, dis uh, very definite way. SARS had done the same before. Any outbreak anywhere in the world can be in the United States, can be in Europe, you name it, in a matter of hours, not days. And that poses a public health threat. There's tremendous benefits, by the way, to our global world. I think it's fantastic that the world's becoming more global. I think it's changing. And again, can maybe make this concept of global public health much more understandable to people. And that, to me, would be a very good benefit. We have to realize the risk associated by the lack of barriers and oceans that we no longer have. So let me talk about uh, Ebola's history uh, and the filoviruses in general. So the filoviruses were first recognized, Ebola is a, a member of the filovirus family, were first recognized in 1967 in August in Marburg, Germany. At that time, individuals presented to the hospital with what was viewed as a hemorrhagic fever, and I'll talk more about symptoms of hemorrhagic fever in a second. Um, and then subsequently another individual presented in Belgrade with hemorrhagic fever as well. And the authorities figured out that all these people presenting with disease had one thing in common, and that was they had, con had contact either with the tissues or with live African green monkeys. And all of these monkeys had come from a single batch that had been captured in Uganda, brought to Germany to be used for vaccine work and research. So everybody who developed this disease had had contact with the monkeys. The monkeys themselves had become sick. And when people looked at samples, tissue samples, um, from the 31 individuals who became sick, and seven people actually died, so the initial mortality rate in that first outbreak was about 23 cases. Um, they found a virus, and I don't have a pointer up here, I don't think. Um, but you can see these rod-shaped these rod shaped shapes here um, are uh, the Marburg, what would then became known as the Marburg virus, and they're seen both in length 
and cross-section, and they're within cells. And of course, viruses always have to be within cells. They require cells to replicate and survive. And these invaders get into the cells, replicate, then lice and kill the cells. And that's what was happening in the case of Marburg. This is just another kind of cooler picture uh, of viral replication. So the top panel, all those things are coming out of cells. Essentially, these are viral particles escaping from cells. And then you get a closer up view of what these uh, viral particles look like. So this was the first recognition uh, of a filovirus. Subsequently, we recognized Marburg uh, in Africa. There was an outbreak of Marburg virus disease in Africa for the first time. And since that time, there's been seven distinct outbreak of Marburg virus in Africa. So it's occurred seven times now there's been distinct outbreaks. The largest one was in Angola in 2004, where there were 252 cases and 227 deaths for a 90% mortality rate. And that's extraordinary. Uh, that level of, of, of case mortality rate. So Marburg remains a threat. There was a recent small outbreak in Uganda in 2012, and just uh, earlier uh, in October, a case was reported uh, again in Uganda. So Marburg is out there, it's capable of causing disease, just like Ebola. Ebola was first recognized in August 26 of 76, it's when the first cases were reported. The first case was a village schoolmaster uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, then known as Zaire. There was multiple cases that appeared in the hospital where he was being cared for, as well as in family members caring for him. And as you know, this is a recurrent theme, as we now know, for Ebola virus. There were 318 in cases and 280 deaths. Again, a very high uh, mortality associated with this first outbreak. The virus was first thought to be Marburg. They looked at it by electron microscopy, thought it was Marburg, it looked like Marburg. But then when they did serological studies, they recognized it was a distinct virus from Marburg. It wasn't the same virus. And it was named for the nearby Ebola River uh, in DRC, and that's how the virus got its name. And this is the Ebola Zaire strain, and this is the strain that's causing the current epidemic that we're dealing with. It's this original strain recognized of Ebola. Since 1976, uh, Ebola was immediately recognized in the Sudan in another outbreak. That was recognized though as a second strain. So there was Ebola Zaire and now a Sudan strain of Ebola virus. And since that time, there's been about 21 different outbreaks of Ebola before the current outbreak. So we have been dealing with Ebola now um, for 30 plus years in outbreaks in Africa. There was a relatively quiet period between 79 and 94, which I don't completely understand. But since then, it's really been consistent. And every year, every two years, it's been an Ebola. Ebola outbreak. During this time, we recognized three additional species of Ebola as well. And I'll go through the taxonomy here. Um, we don't need to know all these fancy names. They actually, if you understand Latin, they actually make sense in how they describe the different viruses. But these are all what we call RNA viruses. And I mention that only because these are very error-prone viruses in their replication. So their mutation rates are very fast. So single-stranded RNA virus has a very fast mutation rate. They can change very quickly in terms of what they look like. There are two uh, viruses within the filovirida family. I told you Marburg virus, Ebola. I mentioned Ebola. I mentioned Sudan. Reston is really interesting. Reston is a virus that was recognized in Reston, Virginia. So you can see these viruses are being named after the locations that are being identified in Reston, Virginia, uh, in monkeys. Reston made monkeys sick. And some people clearly had Reston infection, but never developed symptoms. So they were infected with Reston virus, people were involved in caring for these monkeys, but never developed any symptoms. And Reston is the only Ebola virus we know of that seems to be able to infect humans, but not cause any disease, uh, which is very interesting. You can imagine a lot of work has been done to try and compare Reston with other Ebola viruses to understand how it's different, to maybe give us some insights into why the original Ebola viruses are so pathogenic. Typhorus Ebola virus and Bungabugyo Ebola virus have both caused disease. Um, mortality has been lower um, with them, and the number of outbreaks has been smaller as well. So this is you know, hard for you to see, and it's not projecting very well. It's a computer graphic image of what an Ebola virus would look like, magnified millions of times. Um, and the only thing I really wanted to point out to you is it has this very interesting helical structure. If you were to dissect through, you'd see it's a helical structure, this long rod I've talked about before. And on the surface, shown, if you can see the original slide, would be a red color with all these granular looking things on the surface. That's the glycoprotein of Ebola. And so when we start talking about vaccines, when we start talking about immune therapies such as ZMAP, they're all targeted against that viral glycoprotein. So I'll return to that in a second, but it's an important part of the viral code. 
And this is just an electron micrograph of the Ebola virus. So the ecology of Ebola virus, not completely understood. We believe Ebola and Marburg, both bats, are the natural hosts for those viruses. We believe they infect bats, but bats don't develop disease with them. But we believe bats are the natural hosts. We believe that non-human primates can become infected by having contact with the bats. That contact may be particularly fruit bats, uh, saliva that fruit bats put on the fruit as they're eating it. Um, this is you know, not great dinner table stuff, but the bat guano as well may contaminate food. Non-human primates eat that food, and they in turn can get infected with Ebola. We believe that may be the mode of transmission. Humans may get diseased by having contact with bats. Again, that certainly may happen with Marburg. It may happen with Ebola as well. But in most cases, we think humans get diseased by having contact with non-human primates that have been infected by bats. Those non-human primates get sick, uh, and they become, they're hunted in parts of Africa for what we call bushmeat, and that may be the mechanism by which it's then transmitted from humans. And what's in humans then, human to human transmission can occur, as we'll talk about in a second. So this just shows a non-human primate to human transmission that's clearly been documented for both Marburg and Ebola, um, and we believe that's the probable source for many of the outbreaks in Africa through the consumption of bushmeat. People are about to consume a baboon here, and contact with the blood of a baboon, if it's been infected with Ebola, could lead to infection uh, in those people. So human-to-human -human transmission. Um, this is something that everybody's talking about. This has been something that everybody's concerned about. Let me make this very clear. Um, transmission occurs when mucous membranes or open skin comes in contact with bodily fluids from a patient who is symptomatic with Ebola. That's what we know about Ebola transmission. That's how it's transmitted. It's not transmitted by a respiratory mechanism. If someone sitting in that front row had measles and you had not been vaccinated by measles, we would have an outbreak of measles that arose from this room. It's respiratorily transmitted. Measles will infect 90% of people that, who come into contact with it through the airborne route. That's a highly contagious disease through airborne transmission. That is not Ebola. You have to come into contact with people, and they have to be symptomatic. I think, and I'm going to diverge a little from, from you know, talk because this will come up later, but one of the things I've been most impressed by um, in this current epidemic is the fact that, as we said earlier, healthcare workers who are caring for people who are highly symptomatic with Ebola, these are people who have vomiting, who have diarrhea, who are bleeding from multiple orifices, they are certainly at risk for acquiring disease, and we've seen that. There's no question about that. And even personal protective that we thought might have been sufficient proved not to be uh, in some cases. That's clearly happened. On the other hand, people who have had contact outside of the healthcare system, even in the case of Duncan, with someone who had a fever, who had been turned away with a fever, had a fever, those five individuals who were living with him didn't develop disease. So I'm very impressed by the fact that I think someone, I think it has to do probably with viral load. This is speculation. I said I would stay away from facts. Now I'm going to speculate. So mark that on your notes and I'm speculating. But I think it probably has to do with the amount of virus that's present in the secretions, where people are uh, in their disease. That determines the infectivity uh, of their secretions and makes a difference. So I think that's very important. That's something we have to keep in mind uh, when we're developing uh, our approach to prevention of disease and to the quarantines uh, that we've been using. Um, contact with materials contaminated by the bodily fluids from a patient with Ebola, that clearly can happen. That's why, again, people are involved in taking care of patients and cleaning up bed linens, things like that, are at risk. And then in Africa, where there's tradition of people preparing the bodies, and of course every culture prepares bodies, uh, for burial, generally, we, in our culture, tend to use undertakers, right? We have professional people who do that, but in places where that's not part of the culture, they prepare the bodies themselves, which makes total sense. But they have been at risk in diseases, for disease as well, by coming in contact with people um, who recently perished um, from Ebola. So I, I'm not going to spend a lot of slot, time on this slide, but this is about the pathogenesis of disease. So if you're an infectious disease doctor like me, this is very interesting for you. We think once the virus gets in to someone, through a break in the skin, through a mucous membrane, we think its first target is a group of cells called monocytes. These are white blood cells that are usually involved in host defense. They help protect you against disease, but the virus hones into these particular cells, and it's capable of killing those cells. 
And once it kills those cells, they release a series of compounds which actually lead to fever, can lead to low blood pressure, can lead to the feelings of malaise, headache, all these things. What we call cytokines are released by these cells. And so we think the early stages of infection associated with fever are probably, rec are probably due to monocytes releasing these kinds of factors. Um, later on, the virus begins to disseminate through the body, riding around on these monocytes, and it has a predilection for what we call endothelial cells. And those are the cells that are lining your blood vessels. So when they get into those cells, they damage the blood vessels. That can lead to bleeding. One of the characteristics of this disease is bleeding from a number of sites. And involvement of endothelial cells can lead to bleeding, as well as more active cytokine release uh, as well. Um, liver can be affected. A number of other organs can be affected. Spleen can be affected. Um, it can really can spread throughout the body. But these are the first phases, we believe, um, of disease. The clinical manifestations I think you've heard about. There's a really broad incubation period, so that's created challenges. People can manifest disease, we believe, from 2 to 21 days in exposure. That's been reported. Most people are between 8 and 10 days, so we think most people are exposed to between 8 and 10 days. The initial symptoms, as I said before, fever, chills, malaise, myalgias, those are muscle aches. Uh, some people have abdominal pain. Some people have earlier manifestations of vomiting uh, and diarrhea. Headache has been seen as well. Um, people then can go to more severe symptoms, uh, hypotension, low blood pressure. I've talked about the GI symptoms. They can predominate diarrhea, a lot of fluid loss associated with it can make care of patients very difficult. Some people have chest pain and cough, more respiratory symptoms, that's a little more unusual. And headache, confusion, and coma can occur. Skin, some patients have a macular papular rash about day five. Um, again, because of shock associated with fluid loss, People can develop symptoms like pancreatitis, so inflammation of the pancreas. They can develop disseminated intravascular coagulation. That's consumption of clotting factors that result in bleeding throughout the body. Um, and death or improvement usually occurs by about day 7 to 11. And so what that tells us, I think, and again, so now I'm a little more on the mode of speculation, but I think it makes sense, is that when you're infected with this virus, there's a contest going on, essentially, between the viral replication in your body and your body's ability to mount its immune response. So all of us are capable of mounting immune responses, generally, in Western immune compromise. That involves the cells that can kill virally infected cells, as well as antibodies that are capable of neutralizing virus. So the fact that day 7 to 11, that's when we would begin to see an antibody response, and we're seeing more cytotoxic T cells being produced. And I think those people were able to survive long enough to mount that effective response, they survive the illness. But if you're not able to mount that response in time and overwhelmed by the virus, then I think you die. And that may have to do, in some sense, with what your initial inoculation is, and of course, the supportive care that you're able to receive. Um, and that's incredibly support, uh, important in terms of how much we can support you during those initial days. Um, survivors may have very prolonged convalescence. I know some of you may have seen the footage uh, of the woman who was released uh, overseas, the nurse's assistant who was just released, who really looked very shaky as she came aboard. That kind of prolonged convalescence is seen with patients with Ebola. These are other clinical manifestations just showing you um, bleeding from the mouth, what we call petechial bleeding, that can be seen, uh, other mucosal hemorrhage. This is a more severe manifestation of disease. These are what we call bullae, where people are essentially bleeding from the skin into these large blisters, and that's been reported to So in areas where they're having an Ebola outbreak, it's very important to define what a diagnosis is, what a suspected case is, what a probable case is, and what a confirmed case is. And that's what's going on in West Africa as well as the US. A suspect case is any person who has a high onset of high fever, but who's in contact with a suspected probable or confirmed Ebola case, or a dead or sick animal in the areas, as I said, where animals are involved in transmission. And there's other definitions of it, depending on where you are and where you are in an outbreak. But that would be a suspected case. A probable case means there's been clinical and documented exposure. So you really have a clinical history that tells you there's a documented exposure. You're evaluated by a physician. And that's now what we would call a probable case of Ebola. And I'll show you that as we look at the statistics for disease that are happening in Africa. And then a confirmed case means you've actually either identified the virus in a sample or you've seen that the person has antibodies to the virus. Either one of those things would confirm that they've been infected with Ebola. And that's very important as you decide to find cases. Therapies right now are very limited. I talked about supportive care therapy, and I'll talk about cases in the U.S. in a second. The ability to provide fluids, 
that people need, the ability to support their blood pressure, the ability to provide transfusions, to treat potential secondary infections. Those are key to keeping people alive and allowing them to survive Ebola. At this moment in time, we have no proven effective antivirals or immunotherapy. So there's nothing that, that's been shown in a double-blind, randomized controlled trial um, to actually make a difference in the outcome of Ebola. There are things that have been shown to be effective in animal models. So we have a reason to believe they might be infected in people as well. And they've been utilized in several of the patients who've had disease. But at this moment in time, I don't think anybody can claim that they were what cured an individual patient. We really would need double-blind, randomized controlled trials to say that, or perhaps better data um, from other models to help us say that. So, outcomes with Ebola, uh, I mentioned before, um, are, are terrible as we look at infectious diseases in general. Mortality rate has ranged from 25% to 90% in major outbreaks. The average is about 65% for all of the viruses and all the outbreaks. Um, higher for Ebola virus, the strain that we're dealing with now, about 80%. And I mentioned before, two of the other outbreaks have had lower mortalities. So let me talk about the current outbreak. Um, the, this was reported initially in March uh, of, of this year from the Ministry of Health in Guinea. 49 cases with 29 deaths already confirmed, uh, confirmed cases by Ebola virus. Um, suspected cases in Sierra Leone and Liberia were announced at the same time. Um, and the first case was recognized as someone actually who died in December of 13. So by the time this was reported, probably the epidemic had been going on since December. Um, and this just shows a map. Um, Guinea is at the top, the largest country, Sierra Leone in the middle, um, Liberia down at the bottom, and you can see the initial cases um, were in Guinea, um, and then there was also those suspected cases under investigation already in Liberia at that time. So when they looked at this virus, it looked like the previous Ebola Zaire strain, but it was different. This, what people felt was it probably diverged from the parent stain about 10 years ago. So this virus had probably been circulating in the jungles, perhaps in bats uh, in that region before it was introduced into humans. Um, the Sierra Leone cases took off much faster than people would have expected. And that may be because of what we call a super spreader phenomena. There was one person who we know infected probably 14 people in Sierra Leone, and that may have very much jump-started the epidemic in that country. There is mutation of the virus ongoing, so if you look at the changes in the virus, just from the first part of the epidemic to later parts of the epidemic, the virus is currently clearly evolving, but there's no evidence that it's changed any of its characteristics or any of the characteristics of the disease associated with that mutation. This is where we are today, or close to today. This was October 29th, and there's two color codes here. I just want you to see how much and how worse the epidemic has gotten. The darkest blue color means there have been 500 to 4,000 cases associated with that region. So any areas that are very dark have had a tremendous number of cases, the dark blue. And then the balls are the number of cases just within the past 21 days. So the largest balls represent 250 to 500 cases uh, within the past 21 days. So this epidemic is still raging uh, in Western Africa. I'm going to go through this really quickly. This is what Ebola disease looks like in Sierra Leone right now. The last bar is November 2. Everything leading up that, the one before that is October 12. And I just want you to see, this still represents primarily an increase in cases. Um, I don't think we can take November 2nd as being significant at this point in time. Cases are still increasing in Sierra Leone at this time. There's a little better news from Liberia, which again is on the left. Again, there's a number of cases being plotted there. The dark represent confirmed cases. The light represent probable cases. In Liberia, there seems to be a tendency for reduction in the number of cases. Now, people have been concerned about whether that's really a reduction or not, um, whether a lot of people are dying in outlying areas, not coming into the centers and being reported. But there does seem to be some encouraging news uh, in Liberia. In Guinea, I would say, really looks relatively steady. Uh, at this point in time, I wouldn't say there had been a diminution, a significant diminution, but also not a significant growth as in Sierra Leone. So this is the worst outbreak ever for Ebola. Um, there's now been 4,922 deaths, 13,703 cases. Um, the fatality per case is about 28%. I know that seems low compared to what I thought about before, but remember, people are going to continue to die. 
So that number is going to continue to increase as time goes by, and the ultimate mortality will be higher than that 28%. And this just shows, this is all the previous deaths from Ebola, and then the outbreak of 2014, and you can see the difference between them. These are the cases in the United States. Okay, I talked about 4,922 deaths. I talked about 13,700 cases. I could put all the cases in the U.S. on one slide, and that's a telling slide, right? So nine cases, essentially, that have been treated in the U.S., as you know, two that were acquired in the U.S. So we are really a tiny, tiny blip in what is a global epidemic. We are a tiny spot in that. Um, the point I'll just make on this is that only one person who's been treated for Ebola in the U.S. during this epidemic died. So out of nine, only one person died. The patient in New York, as you know, uh, seems to be improving. They seem to be out of danger as well. And so I think that really does reflect um, a couple things. It could be a reflection of the therapy some people received, and you can see that people have received different therapies if you're able to read that. Um, some people have received ZMAP. Some people have received blood transfusions for people who were infected uh, and recovered from Ebola. Um, some people have received uh, other antivirals, so it may have something to do with that, but it also may have a lot to do with the tremendous quality uh, of the intensive care unit uh, uh, care that we can provide uh, in the U.S., which really is uh, pretty spectacular, and I think that may have more to do uh, with what happened than anything else. So why is this epidemic so bad? Why in the past were these always controlled, and now why are we up to 13,000 cases? Well, I think it was alluded to by our opening speaker. I think it's poverty, primarily. These were three of the poorest countries in the world where this outbreak took place. They did not have a public health infrastructure that would allow them to deal with this outbreak. It simply did not exist. The mechanisms that work, we know what the mechanisms are that work, and I'll talk about it in a second, but they didn't have it. Some of these initial outbreaks were closer to urban centers, which may, again, have facilitated transmission, higher population density, more, more opportunity for transmission. And I don't think there's anything different about the virus. That's been raised before. Is the virus different from before? I see no reason to believe there's anything different. I think this really had to do with the public health infrastructure in those countries and, unfortunately, probably the tardiness of the global response to the outbreak. So how do you control this outbreak? Well, really, it's back to what's worked before. It's about case identification, isolation of cases and contacts, strict barrier precautions for suspected cases, um, adequate training for people who are caring for these people, so the risk for health care workers becomes more minimized. Um, the importance of the equipment that's necessary, that's very key. And education about the, about the disease, particularly in the areas where outbreaks are occurring to help prepare people. All those things have been important. Um, we need more than what's happened currently. The United States has stepped up. As you've heard, the President has now asked for $6 billion to help. A lot of that money would go to Western Africa where it's needed. The U.S. military has stepped up. Cubans have made a major contribution. EU are coming and contributing as well. But we need more. The Chinese have made significant contributions. When, during the SARS outbreak in Beijing, the Chinese built a 1,000-bed hospital to treat SARS patients in seven days. Okay, in seven days, they built a 1,000-bed hospital. We need the same kind of logistics, essentially, in West Africa to help turn this around. So what's next? I'm going to wrap up here. We need drugs that can treat this infection. We need vaccines that can prevent this infection. We need more rapid diagnostic tests and more easily deployable diagnosis that can help us manage and more rapidly identify people in terms of the issues of isolation. And we actually have some things in the pipeline. This is really important. We have diagnostics. Again, that came from biomedical research that helped develop that. And we actually have products in the pipeline. And that is because, as I mentioned at the beginning, your tax dollars to NIH, that supported NIH, that supported the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and the Department of Defense, that money has helped us develop things that I think are going to make a difference, if not in this epidemic, certainly in the next one. ZMAP is one of those. That's a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies that target the Ebola virus, the glycoprotein I mentioned currently. That has been shown to work in non-human primates up to five days after a high-dose inoculation with Ebola virus. So there's very good data for survival with that drug. Seven individuals to date, maybe more, have received the drug. Two survived, two died, um, but, and the other three survived. But the problem is we've run out of drug. So that drug requires, it has to be made, it's a recombinant protein, essentially, a series of proteins that have to be made. It's actually made in transgenic tobacco plants. 
So this is a great use for tobacco, actually. We can actually make a drug that can help people with Ebola. Uh, but the supply of drug is exhausted, and the company doesn't know when they're going to generate enough doses to put it into more broad use. TKM Ebola is another drug that's being used. This targets viral replication. Again, there's problems with doses in this drug, and again, tough to evaluate its eff efficacy overall. It certainly works in non-human primate models. And then vaccines. The strategy here has been not to make a vaccine out of the Ebola virus, measles virus. Vaccine, measles vaccines are made out of killed measles virus. Here, people don't want to work with the Ebola virus, try and attenuate it. Instead, what they've done is they've taken genes from Ebola viruses, just single proteins that code single proteins or even smaller parts, and to put them into other vaccine vectors to provide a much higher degree of safety, these kind of subunit vaccines. And so the one that's, I think, most out there right now is the one that Glaxo is making. This is a vaccine derived from a chimp that's in a chimp adenovirus, expresses the glycoprotein. Um, it's looked effective, again, in non-human primates. Glaxo says they can get 10,000 doses available very soon. This hopefully will deploy in the field very soon. It's gone through phase one trials and has been safe in phase one trials in humans. The idea, we, I think, again, would be to do a randomized controlled trial on this. You're not going to have enough vaccine to vaccine, vaccinate everyone who would want it, so it makes sense to do a randomized controlled trial, but then vaccinate as many people as you can once the vaccine has been tested. There are other approaches, including other viruses that have been talked about. And I'll just point out, as I said before, that the NIH has been spending about $40, $50 million per year in basic research. They've been funding small companies to do this research as well. This was a different paradigm, but it's really helped us be much more prepared than we were before. It normally takes decades from the time people identify a protein, for example, to the time we have the vaccine you can test. So infectious diseases are here to stay. They're not going to be eradicated in my or your lifetime. Mutation rates make uh, viruses highly adaptable, so they really can create an arms race, essentially, where they can change and we have to develop new drugs and new vaccines to try and prevent them. But this is a global problem and requires a global perspective. Sustained high-level supportive research, coupled with a robust public health infrastructure, is absolutely key to controlling this threat. And I think, again, I'm going to make a plea for you to continue to support this kind of research and this kind of public health infrastructure. So now, let's talk about the threat right here on Long Island and how we're beginning to prepare for it. And I'd ask our panel um, to come up to the stage and uh, uh, Liz, and I'm going to introduce them. Um, if the cards on your seats are for questions, and if you can write it, if you have a question uh, for Dr. Stanley, and you can write it on the cards and pass them to the center aisles, um, we'll pick them up from you, and he'll answer. He'll take a few questions while I introduce the panel. You guys can go up. That was excellent. Thank you so much. to the center aisle, and I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, so we have uh, Zinab, uh, Zinab Ataru, who's a nurse researcher and a doctoral student at Columbia University, and she's going to speak about the, uh, the personal effects of Ebola in Sierra Leone. Dr. Dorana Armelino, who's the Vice President for Infection Control at North Shore Long Island Jewish Health System, and who has set up the uh, NASA receiving a bowl unit at Glen Cove Hospital. Dr. Ruven Pasternak, the, C, uh, the CEO and Vice President for the Health Systems at Stony Brook University Hospital, which is Suffolk designated Ebola hospital. Dr. Politi, who's the president and CEO of New Health, and thank you guys so much for coming. Dr. Larry Eisenstein, the commissioner of the Nassau County Department of Health, and Dr. Barry Rosenthal, the director of Winthrop University's emergency department here in um, Mineola. So they're gonna speak a little about, from their own perspective about Ebola, and then we'll take questions uh, from the audience. And if you have cards, you can bring them up. Let's go ahead and start, and then we'll use the questions to ask questions of the panel as well. So any questions you can ask, we ask the panel as well. So um, um, 
Ms. Oturu, um, tell us a little bit about what's happening in Sierra Leone um, from your perspective and, and what some of the issues are. Well, thank you for having me here. And you've got my
the very elements that propagate and potentiate the spread of Ebola are the only things that these people continue to have hope for. For so many people today, in Sierra Leone and in West Africa in general, the strongest fear is not just for Ebola virus as a disease, but the strongest fear is also the fear of not knowing who, what, in what we can have hope for as a healthcare system and as a system that can move healthcare or the future of places like Sierra Leone forward. I have to also share that it's not just about sending public health messages in places like Sierra Leone, but it's also uh, the Ebola virus challenges us as a region to look at our, our healthcare practices and how else we can improve not just infectious disease, but things like maternal mortality and starvation, so many other things that have plagued this community and why it has not responded to so much of the messaging and the efforts to improve healthcare and the outcomes of health in Sierra Leone in particular. We're at a critical time right now, not just for Sierra Leone, but for West Africa in general. And this time has made a strong impact for global health as well, as we all know. And, and, and as we all know, and I'm sure we all understand, that introducing fear in the community or population is not the only way and does not motivate people to change their healthcare behavior. Our message needs to continue to address some of the burning questions that impact the Ebola virus disease and strategies and it needs to convey some kind of messaging that speaks to the people with respect for their culture and their communities. And not just that, but speaks and motivates or activates the entire community to be open to say, yes, we can report cases of elevated temperatures. We can report cases when, they are, when we know that someone else is affected from the Ebola virus. Because the fear and the anguish and the sense of hopelessness that has taken over the community at this time it would make it difficult for us to not say that the cases are not underreported. For Sierra Leone, there is still a lot of work to be done to restore the confidence of the people in the healthcare system. And I, re I call the statements that continue to be spoken in the streets of Sierra Leone today that Ebola virus in Sierra Leone took over the town like the Civil War did. We were very unprepared and there was no notice uh, given and we still don't know what to do about it. And who knows what the future of Sierra Leone would be when and if this ever gets contained. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really a, 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 a wonderful uh, statement in terms of bringing the importance of the culture, what's happening regionally, um, to bear uh, in, in this question. Thank you for doing that. Um, next, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Donna Armolino, who's Vice President for Infection Control at North Shore LIJ, Talk a little bit about what you're doing in terms of preparation. Well, good evening, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I just want to highlight, um, healthcare facilities are constantly evaluating what's going on in their community, as well as internationally. And the reason for the awareness is you need to be aware of symptoms, what's occurring uh, from an infectious disease standpoint. So at least you could recognize these diseases that present. So awareness of Ebola, as mentioned, started in March. So there was awareness in the hospitals uh, within uh, you know this year, but it really intensified, intensified in July uh, and in August, and more so in September. We initially started out with an awareness campaign uh, just to elevate the awareness of healthcare providers within a facility. The key area to identify cases would be both in the ambulatory setting and in emergency departments. Increase awareness on what questions had to be asked and what symptoms needed to be identified. And once the identification of symptoms and travel was identified, what next? Um, the next steps that were given to employees was you isolate the patients and then you get more information uh, on the particular case and then communicate with the Department of Health uh, to, to see whether or not it does meet case criteria. Now, from a health system standpoint, we ended up putting together an emergency management uh, structure. And the reason for the emergency management structure is you need to identify individuals that are within the health system that could help respond uh, to this particular situation that presented. Training, uh, resources such as uh, structural engineers, um, even individuals that could possibly look to see what facilities within the health system could help support the care of a patient in the event that they did 
present to the facility. So we prepared our emergency departments. The next step was to see where we could potentially care for the patients. We assessed the health system. We were able to identify a particular location where we could build and create the appropriate private rooms and the support space that is needed to care for these patients once uh, they are admitted. From a healthcare personnel standpoint, we knew we had to train all the emergency department individuals. You did not know which facility they would present. They needed to recognize, they needed to know where to place the patient, and they needed to know what to wear while caring for the patients. So they received training, and it was training that was done one-on-one -on -one through iLearn systems, and even return demonstration with the important aspects of putting on and taking off PPEs. We then realized from an inpatient perspective, we did not have the appropriate support, support spaces within our hospitals. Uh, so as I mentioned, we, we created a hospital within a hospital. Um, it's a particular unit. It is, has a separate entrance. It's locked down at the entrance. Uh, we have the negative pressure rooms. There's observation areas so we could observe the patients. We also have a separate space where individuals could take off the personal protective equipment that could potentially contaminate themselves as well as the environment. Once we identified this space, we were then in the training mode. It's very important to have individuals that want to care, so we ended up getting volunteers, and we are training them in the environment in which they would work and they're training over and over and over again. It's one thing to put these suits on, try to work with them. So we're looking at full face gear, you're looking at two pairs of gloves, you're looking at a full suit that also closes your shoes. Try to start an IV, try to put in a central line. So these are certain tasks that we take for granted that we could do on a normal day-to-day -day routine, but now we have to train people to work in protective gear so they can be protected, but also to be able to deliver the care that they need to deliver. Um, we have a number of cohorts, so we have groups of individuals, uh, both critical care nurses, which is mostly the composite of the staff that have volunteered, as well as intensivists and ED physicians that will give up their time in the events that we accept a patient. They will no longer do their day job. They will then be assigned to this unit until the patient is discharged. And, and the entire time they will also be monitoring themselves because we need to ensure that they are no risk to the public. So they will also be on a very intensive monitoring program so we can identify whether or not they present with um, symptoms that also need to, uh, to uh, evaluation. So this is an ongoing effort. Um, we are preparing. Uh, we all hope that we do not have to uh, accept the patient. Uh, but in the event someone does present, does need care, we are prepared to deliver the care that the patient needs. Thank you. My colleague Ruben Pasternak, can you talk a little bit about Stony Brook's preparation? Thank you, Sam. So uh, we've had an experience very similar to our colleagues in North Shore, but as, this, as the drama started unfolding, um, one of the things we did was to reach out to the public health department, because as we realized that it was a cascade of concern about the threat real and perceived that this was posing in, in Suffolk County and the region in general, we wanted to be sure that the efforts that we were undertaking we're in sync with the Department of Health because there is very much public health dimension to this. So uh, it's, it was a month ago, seems like it's significantly longer. Uh, we established regular contact with the health departments that we coordinated what it was we were doing, what the message was that we were getting out there because it was very important to us that there was a proper narrative of what exactly we were dealing with. What was the problem? How did we define it? At our own institution, as we undertook the preparations, deal with a possible Ebola patient, we had 6,000 staff who were very concerned about what it is we are actually dealing with and how we're addressing it. So as we started the preparations for the ability to deal with a patient that came in, we explained that the process was to isolate, identify first, isolate, 
and treat the patients, and that we had three commanding imperatives. One was to be sure that the patient was getting the appropriate treatment, the best treatment that was available, that the staff that were treating that individual were as protected as any staff could be in that process, and that we were also working with the external environment, the public health department principally, but also the hospital council and other agencies, law enforcement officials, so that if we did have a patient who had Ebola, we also were working to mitigate the impact on the community to be sure that whatever other contacts there were were being identified. Um, we followed the same concepts you did in terms of isolation, identifying facilities, looking at areas where patients could be taken so that from the moment they're identified, they and any family members or anybody else who may have accompanied them to the facility are immediately put into an isolated area, dedicated nursing and physician team in the emergency department and in the intensive care unit or on call so that the moment that happened, it triggered those teams coming out, caring only for those individuals and freeing up other people in the emergency department and elsewhere to do their chores so that we maintain that strict isolation. The other part that was very important for us also in the preparation was the team. We built on what we already had in terms of a dedicated team since we're a level one trauma center. We had the nucleus of individuals who were used to being able to respond to a significant concern and threat. We added to that clinical epidemiologists, more facilities people, made sure that the structure, materials, and staff that we had were appropriate for being able to treat the patients. And in terms of choosing what was the correct treatment and what was the correct protocols, you may recall there seemed to be an evolving sense of how you deal with patients in terms of protective equipment and what was the right standard to use. So we decided to move right ahead to the most rigorous standard for protective gear and not wait for a constantly evolving standard to constantly take us forward. So by adopting that, we could assure our staff and assure patients, their families and ourselves, that we had established those, those criteria. And I think they're the same that you have in, in terms of uh, managing those individuals. So we've also learned geography because as, uh, as we started to prepare and have the system set up, um, we had somebody who came in and said they had come from Djibouti. And somebody said, oh my goodness, I think that's in Africa. And that automatically triggered the system going into effect. And then somebody looked at the map and said, that's about 2,000 miles away. And fortunately, by that time, the public health response around the world had, had approved so that as this individual traveled, they had been screened in Frankfurt, they had been screened at JFK. So that, in fact, there already had been a worldwide response as to what was uh, going to be the screening of these individuals. So today we've had three people of concern. Uh, none of them turned out to be positive on further history. None of them required any of the isolation procedures. We are prepared. We have close to 400 staff now who are trained. Um, and as you've heard, it's not a matter of doing it once. You have to do it multiple times and keep doing it going into the future. So as we are looking at where we are now in terms of capability of being able to manage, we, like nine other hospitals in New York State, um, have been designated for this purpose. There are others who have the capability and have prepared themselves for it if necessary. But something I think that's worth keeping in mind and as a lesson perhaps in the future, as we bring these beds online and we add up all the beds of hospitals in New York State that are saying they have the capability of doing this, that number is still less than 30 right now across the entire state. That's not a large number of beds to care for an epidemic proportion disease, such as what we're talking about. Fortunately, we don't think that is going to happen, but I think on the very positive side, this has reopened the idea that public health is critical, that as we are looking at how we respond to this, it's not just a matter of taking acute care facilities and being able to prepare them for the patient, but it's going beyond there to how we are able to respond preferably in a um, anticipate and prevent, but also if we were to have this on a larger scale. And the fact that this has reestablished an intense and good communication between us and the public health domain and also with other institutions has been something that we want to build on after the Ebola concerns of Great, thank you.
Dr. Eisenstein, I, I want to turn to you. We, we just heard how important um, public health is. Um, you obviously are the commissioner for Nassau County. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the Department of Health and, 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 and how you see, has this changed the dialogue in some ways? Sure, Dr. Stanley. And during that wonderful presentation that you made, you mentioned the phrase public health infrastructure. And while this is certainly tragic for the thousands of people globally who have succumbed to Ebola, and we're doing a lot of work to prepare should the case come, this has also given an opportunity to public health. And while you don't wish for it to come this way, we certainly have to take advantage of it. Even this meeting today, this is a chance to discuss the significance, the importance of that public health infrastructure that Dr. Stanley had spoke about. This, is, this meeting is going on here, as many of them are going on nationally. Adelphi has done a great job with the Center of Health in Initiatives to have continual public health meetings. But I have had the privilege in the past couple of weeks of speaking to groups that I've never been able to speak to before. Uh, an election day when the schools were closed to children, but the staff had to come in. I met with all of the school nurses in Nassau County, and I was so excited to have that platform to talk. It started, at the concept was, we'll bring calm and talk about Ebola, but in fact, we spoke very little about Ebola because the school nurses in Nassau County are wise enough to ask the few questions, find the information that they need, and we spoke about other very vital, timely public health initiatives. We talked about how this is a chance to emphasize the significance of flu vaccine. During Dr. Stanley's presentation, he talked about the symptoms that will come in the case of an Ebola case. Sudden, abrupt onset of fever, myalgias. That's the way flu onsets. And I have no shame when it comes to trying to get people vaccinated for flu. We're even sending the message, don't be a false alarm if you're a traveler. Get your flu vaccine because Flu is a virus that will present with similar symptoms, and if you have travel history, you can find yourself ending up quarantined because you didn't get a flu vaccine. This has also given us opportunity, besides talking about public health in the national stage, which as public health commissioner, I, I'm constantly doing, but people are here listening, and, and it's exciting, and it, it's a shame to a degree that it takes a tragedy to do that, but we have to take advantage of it. We have seen unprecedented collaboration. I have had the pleasure of visiting with Dr. Politi, who's going to speak shortly, as he, I was amazed when we met and watched the training that he was doing of all of his staff to prepare for the possibility that a patient with Ebola would come into the emergency room. It was so good, we asked them to, to come and do the presentation for our first responders, our fire, our volunteer EMS, and we've trained, they've trained in collaboration with us, hundreds of our first responders. And the response to Ebola, the use of personal protective equipment. The training, we shouldn't think of it as we're training for Ebola. As Dr. Stanley discussed, we know Mother Nature is going to throw some infectious disease at us again in the future. It's the history. It's our history. And so learning how to use proper PPE is not about Ebola. It's about training a public health response workforce for the future. I had the pleasure of visiting Glen Cove, North Shore, uh, a couple of days ago and seeing the wonderful facility that they built in the unlikely possibility, the unlikely probability, I should say, that we get a patient. I watched them doing the training, the hours of training that they do in the facility that they set up is fabulous. And we hope we'll never have to use that facility for Ebola, but it's there for when we will need it. And so while we're doing the contact investigations and the tracings, and while we're preparing for the possibility that we're going to be faced with returning travelers of high risk, which has not yet happened in Nassau County. The public health attorney at our department, Jerry Giuliano, who's a close friend, is sitting in the front row and has the quarantine orders that I would need to sign with them. Hopefully we'll never have to do that. We really have seen unprecedented collaboration. I've spoken to the leadership at Winthrop Hospital. I've spoken to the leadership at Mercy Hospital. I've spoken to everybody saying, what can we do? We brought all the hospitals together in a spirit of collaboration, partnership, and it's amazing how people have worked together. And I, I really think that hopefully we won't see a patient. We will continue to do our contact investigations. People don't realize that our communicable disease team at the Nassau County Department of Health responds to 81 reportable diseases year-round. The majority of them, thankfully, are not fatal, so it doesn't make public news. 
There's over 30,000 investigations done by our department each year to make sure that disease is not spread. And as I heard Dr. Politi say on a press conference one night, hospitals and public health are prepared to, to control and prevent disease transmission. This is what we do. I'm appreciative of the opportunity to share that spotlight to say we need to continue investing in public health. We need to help build the public health infrastructure which goes way beyond the local health department. It goes to our hospital partners, it goes to our first responders, it goes to our governmental policy makers. And this is our chance to remind everybody, hey, we're here, you need us, we need you, let's work together at it. So while, again, we are saddened by the tragic events that have led to this and the lives that have been lost, a lot of good can come of this and, and many, many, many lives can be saved. And we've seen how public health initiatives as simple as providing clean water and providing vaccinations have saved not millions but billions of lives worldwide. This is our chance to, to remind everybody that we need to invest in public health and build that infrastructure. It's a great comments, and um, you know, I'm going to second what you said about influenza. There's no question that more people will die um, from influenza during this flu season than will die from Ebola, even in the outbreak in Africa. So this remains a significant public health threat. Roughly 100 children every year who could be vaccinated die from influenza in the United States. So vaccination uh, uh, is, is a, such an important uh, tool uh, in the prevention of infectious disease, and, and I want to emphasize that. So, again. Great comments. Dr. Politi, we, we, we heard uh, some of your thoughts uh, through Dr. Eisenstein already, but I wonder if you would address in your role as uh, President and CEO of New Health Systems uh, what you're doing and some of your thoughts about the challenges we face right now. Sure, thank you very much. Well, so uh, Nassau University Medical Center, uh, it's uh, the level one trauma center here on Hempson Turnpike. We receive a lot of ambulances, uh, it's very busy. Uh, ER, the helicopters are landing all the time. And like Dr. Eisenstein said when we talked, uh, I mean, the hospitals are prepared for infectious diseases. That's what we do. Uh, tuberculosis, uh, you know, all sorts of upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, patients come to the ER, come to the hospital, we have the equipment and the training. But Ebola brings us to a different level. Ebola requires a lot more vigilance on our part to prevent some of the spreads of these diseases to our healthcare workers. With us, it came back in August. Uh, it was sort of a rude awakening when we get a call about 9 o'clock at night that the West Hempstead Fire Department is bringing in an Ebola patient to the emergency room. Now, this is before Duncan and before really a lot of the media picked up on it. But as you said, in, in the healthcare community, we heard it. We knew it was out there. We were on high alert. We were preparing our staff to look for patients that had signs and symptoms of these types of contagious diseases as well as travel to some of the endemic areas. Well, here we are getting faced with a school teacher from an endemic area in West Africa who, nine days ago, flew into JFK and now has a high fever. Uh, the ambulance arrived. Uh, our crew at the hospital was ready with the PPE, put them in one of our isolation rooms, and we went through the standard precautions that we normally do with people with upper respiratory tract infections and potential infectious uh, respiratory diseases. Uh, but what we didn't prepare for when I showed up was uh, like four police cars with the cops in the car, a fire truck, and all these ambulances with the, the crews still in them that were afraid to get out, and they didn't know what to do. They really thought they had an Ebola patient, and they were very frightened. What happens to us? Can I go home with my family? What do we do with the truck? Uh, you know, all these simple questions, and no one really had the answers to them. Uh, we admitted the person to the hospital, we're in isolation, and uh, luckily, and I say luckily, uh, the infectious disease people, uh, she had a malaria. Because basically, you never had to tell someone how good news you have to But that's what we thought. And we were happy for that. Uh, and so we realized right then and there that Nassau County uh, Emergency Services and the hospitals were not quite prepared for a disease as virulent as this. And so what we did is began training, training the firemen, the policemen, um, and the EMS providers. And we had a series of lectures. And what I found when we had a room uh, in, the, in the hospital, the auditorium, at the first time that I did this, 300 firemen showed up in the MS providers, then another 300. And we wound up doing over 800 first responders because they have a real concern, just like you do, that you showed up here tonight to hear this. So do they. And they were really concerned because they have a dedication, much like all of us healthcare workers do, 
that when that bell rings, these guys are going. These guys, ladies, in the middle of the night are going to go out there, you know, in their cars to the firehouse and show up at your house to, to take you to the hospital. And they don't want to be put at risk or their families at risk for having these things. So we're going through a lot of training with them. Uh, we are actually having another drill Tuesday. People come with fake patients to the ER, uh, dressed in the, uh, in the protect protective equipment, and we watch them doff the suit. So they have to down the suit. Well, you're pretty clean when you're putting it on and you know how to do it. But we found that, that a lot of them had a problem taking the suit off without contaminating themselves. And what we actually did was take uh, shaving cream and we put it on the outside of their suits um, so that as they take the suit off on their gloves and their suit, if they should take it off and, and wind up with the shaving cream on their hands or on their face, and say, you just you know, uh, violated some of the uh, strict protocols. And that guess what? Now you're a patient. We bring you in and we you take care of you and watch you for that. We also established with Dr. Eisenstein a system where we'll follow up with all the EMS providers that were on those calls and that we'll be able to call them twice a day to find out if they have symptoms. And we're going to take your ambulance. So I told them, you bring me an Ebola patient, we're going to keep your ambulance. You're not going to have ambulance. And we're going to keep it, and I told them for 24 hours, normally the turnaround time, they like 6 to 12 hours, we'll get something back telling us whether or not it was a confirmed Ebola case. But I told them 24 hours, we'll keep your ambulance. Um, if it's a regular routine, not non-Ebola, you can come get back, you know, get your ambulance to do a regular terminal cleaning. But if it's Ebola, well, you're not going to get your ambulance back. We have a professional company come get this uh, ambulance to clean up. So, you know, we, we're doing everything that we're being told by the, by the Department of Health and the CDC, uh, just like uh, our, our partners in North Shore and Stony Brook are doing. And we're prepared in the hospital with the uh, isolation rooms and the training, and we're continuously doing that stuff. Uh, but we thought we'd just take this a step further and try to get the first responders involved and to get them up to speed as well. And we have a series of classes scheduled for all the first responders uh, to do this. So uh, thank you very much uh, for giving us up. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Rosenthal, you're, you're on the front lines in, in Winthrop at the emergency room. You want to talk a little bit about what you all have been doing to prepare? Sure. So I'm the, the last of six fantastic speakers who have pretty much said it all. So I'll try to keep your attention for a few more minutes. So, um, although I'm chairman of the emergency department at uh, Winthrop, I'm really here to tell you about what Winthrop Hospital in general has done for the, uh, uh, for the Ebola initiative, because this is a hospital-wide uh, issue. It is not something that is just confined to the emergency department. And, and I would just share with you what I've witnessed over the past uh, several weeks, which uh, happened at Winthrop, and I'm sure it's happened the hospital uh, representative, on, representative on this uh, panel. Um, once uh, after the uh, incident occurred in Dallas uh, with Mr. Duncan, uh, it became clear that uh, there were several root causes to the problem that occurred down there. Uh, and those primarily were that he was not uh, appropriately identified, isolated, and, and the personal protective equipment that was being used was not adequate. So a mandate was given. Uh, not just a corrective action for the hospital in Dallas, but a corrective action for all hospitals throughout the country to make sure that you identify, isolate, uh, and uh, use the correct protective, uh, personal protective equipment prior to treating these patients. Now, that was the mandate. Nobody said how to do that. And so, uh, basically, every hospital in my hospital, this was from senior leadership down, President, CEO, senior uh, 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 administration, our nursing leadership, engineering, health uh, informatics. You know, it was like a mini hospital uh, initiative. We all got together many, many times to figure out how we're going to do this. Now, it sounds easy. Okay, well, let's identify these patients. You just ask them a few questions. Have you traveled in the past 21 weeks? Have you 21 days? Have you traveled internationally? Okay, yes. Where have you been? West Africa. What countries? Oh, okay. I've identified you're a potential patient. Then what? We ask the question, then what? Now, in my emergency department, we have three isolation rooms. Two of them are negative pressure rooms, which are a better type of isolation room, which is a non negative pressure room. But we have three negative isolation rooms. And this is how it works if you go into one of our isolation rooms. And you're going to use personal protective equipment. You stand outside the door, you put on the personal protective equipment, you look down, mask, gloves, you walk in the room, you 
you do what you want to do, you walk out of the room, you take off your personal protective equipment, you roll it up in the ball, and then you throw it in the garbage. That might be what tactic initially in Dallas, I'm not sure. But the level of protection, personal protective equipment that you need for a ball up far exceeds what we were able to provide in our emergency department. So uh, what we uh, did was we basically made the decision that we do not see a ball for all the patients in our emergency department. If you come into the triage area and you are asked these questions, you are immediately escorted to another area, sort of adjacent to the emergency department, but away from all other patients, where, um, now, this is not as impressive as Dr. Stanley mentioned, where they were able to build a 1,000 bed hospital in seven days. We were, they would have built a one like good isolation unit in two days. All right, but that was still pretty good. So, so we have a dedicated isolation room with a, uh, an ante room, with a, a, a utility room, with we have a lab set up there, and, um, and basically we took out four beds to create this one bed, um, but it, functionally the room is the way the room should be. Um, we have also trained our staff, and our staff is it's receiving our own training on how to don and off personal equipment, equipment. This is the one thing that I had the most concerns about being uh, the chairman of the emergency department. Is that in the care of Ebola patients, the mindset changes dramatically from what's hardwired in us as emergency medicine providers. And what's hardwired in us as emergency medicine providers is that you have to act fast. You have to jump. You have to move. You, you can't, but with these patients, it takes about 20 minutes to put on the personal protective equipment. Now, maybe we can do it faster once we have more experience, but I'd say at least 10. But that's, it's just, it's certainly not in nurses, like blood, emergency nurses, to have a sick patient and need to, to, to take to 15 minutes to get to that patient. So having to say to our medical and nursing staff, listen guys, you gotta slow down. You gotta slow down. Is, is, uh, uh, is, is big, but it's a message that we've gotten out, and we are, you know, we can only hope for that. And the, the patients who come to us, we are suspected single of all patients or possible ones who are not that sick, and we have some time to do what we need to do to put on our personal protective equipment, we're going to manage perfectly fine. It, it could be more problematic if somebody walks in the door possible all that and they are very sick. I mean, that always happen. But if it happens, we're going to do what we can. We're going to take care of our the health and the of our staff. We're going to get to that patient as quickly as we can. We're going to do this the best for the patient. Um, now that we have our goal, now that we have our room built, and now that we've done all the personal protective equipment and training, and we, we, uh, it's going to be ongoing. And so of course now the Ebola here seems to be subsiding. I mean, we went from here where there were four cases, you know, we didn't know at the start of all this, but there was four cases, or there were eight cases, there were 12 cases, there were 20, there were 50, you know. but of course that didn't happen. So we got to four cases, uh, um, three in Dallas and one in uh, New York, and everything seems to be fine. So when I look at that group that we built, and I don't know all this training that we were developing, I don't think, wow, that was a waste. And I also don't think, like, that room is being the Ebola room. I just think of it as it's great that we have a room here. It's great that we're learning about personal protective equipment because if it's not Ebola, it could very well be something else. And I think that from a public health point of view, if nothing else comes from that, it has raised the bar for hospitals throughout the country to have some place, a process in place to take care of patients. We have some really thoughtful questions, and I, I appreciate uh, everyone who submitted some. And we may have time to still do some more. Um, I, I'm going ahead and pick some, and I may paraphrase sometimes. If I don't read exactly what you wrote, it's not that you write a good question; it's just something to put it a little differently. Um, th this first one, I, you know, I think uh, Dr. Eisenstein, I'm, I'm going to point towards you um, because it begins. I'm a school nurse, and I work in a school district that deals with children uh, who are world travelers. 
Um, over 60 nationalities are, are there, uh, including uh, folks who are originally from Africa and South America. Uh, in their 13 years, they've seen chickens pox, measles, malaria, TB, and hepatitis in their school. So, so how does their school prepare, essentially, uh, for, for the potential threat that we see for Ebola? Sure. So this is a question that we've been asked numerous times. The question has also arisen that college students travel frequently as well. And we know the break is going to be coming up. And when they get back to the dorm, there's no place to isolate in the dorm what to do. And so the answer to that I would give is twofold. First, and I discussed this with the school nurses the other day, and I think it brought a lot of comfort, we have uh, a plan in place where we are notified of every single traveler that's coming to our county, whether a school student, a senior citizen, or anything in between, that's been to the affected areas. The CDC and the State Health Department have a list. Anybody that's coming to our county, and every county in New York is getting this. Obviously, most uh, of these travelers are going to New York City, and as the border county of New York City, we watch closely. We've had a handful of travelers over the past couple of weeks. Anybody coming in from those affected countries by CDC rule has to come through one of five airports. The fact is the overwhelming majority of them, the flights come through JFK. We know JFK is basically on the border of Nassau County, beyond a little bit of water in Queens. And so we get a list every day of all the travelers who are coming. When we get that list, there's a risk attached to it. That was them, not me. <laughs> um, feel like Elvis. All right. So, so we get a list, and risk is attached to them. People that, let's say, they just were on a plane, I'm making up a hypothetical scenario, that landed in Liberia and then kept going on, that would be considered zero risk if, if they weren't exposed to any patients. If they were exposed to patients, that would be high risk, and there's categories in between. The amount of um, the amount of observation that we're providing is based on the guidance from the CDC and the State Health Department based on risk, and it extends from a phone call to get to ask people how they feel, all the way up to potential for quarantine. Um, so. So we know who's coming. Now, somebody asked me, is it possible that somebody takes a route unlike the typical flights to the couple of airports in Europe, and in other words, they travel instead of west, they travel east, and they find their way in? It's possible, but very, very unlikely. And, and again, as Dr. Stanley said, this is not a disease that's transmitted easily. The fact is, if there have been approximately 10,000 cases in the affected countries, we should remember it's a very, very small percentage of the population of those countries, which is numerous millions of, of people. And those countries don't necessarily have in place the protective equipment, the sanitary conditions, and the, and the other mechanisms that we have to avoid disease transmission. So the truth is that scenario is very, very, very unlikely. However, the second answer to that is one of the things that I keep informing people is that the CDC has done an amazing job with the frequently asked questions section of their website, and it's categorized based on your interest. Frequently asked questions for hospitals, frequently asked questions for medical offices outpatient, frequently asked questions for schools, pediatricians. There's a whole bunch of categories, and I urge everybody to go to cdc.gov and so many of the questions that are being asked are very clearly answered. It's being updated virtually by the hour. And when this first started a couple of months ago, and, I, and I've been getting great updated guidance from the CDC and the State Health Department, we met today in Albany with the State Health Commissioner. All of the, all of the county health commissioners and directors met with the State Health Commissioner this morning. It's been a long day. But, um, but, the, but the communication is there, and it's excellent. And the fact is that so many of the questions and concerns, all you got to go to is the cdc.gov or the New York State Department of Health website. The, C the New York State Department of Health has a 24-hour live operator answer hotline. Should anybody, whether you're driving an ambulance or a nurse in a school or just somebody who's interested, that you can call. Um, I have it on my, uh, on my phone, which I'll pull out when somebody else is answering the next question. And I'll give it to you before you go. But there is a 24-hour-a-day answered by not 
Not people who are going to give you the runaround by people who are trained to answer a, questions on Ebola that New York State Department of Health has launched 24 hours, seven days a week. And so one of the most important messages for whoever asked that question is, do not feel alone. Any questions, call the Nassau County Health Department, or call the Suffolk County Health Department, or call Barry, call whoever you have to. But there are a lot of resources available, I joke, but CDC, State Health Department, County Health Department, we, County Health Department and State Health Department are both available 24 hours, seven days a week. The phone numbers are on our website. So any concern, any concern, we're happy to come. We're happy to meet with parents. We're happy to meet with administrators. It's been my life for the last three or four weeks, just meeting with people and educating them. And I might have to steal some of the slides from Dr. Stanley because that was the best of all the presentation I've seen. So I hope that answers the question. Well, thank you. Um, it, it does, and I, I think uh, in, 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 in a very spectacular manner. So, um, so here's another one that I, I'd ask all the panel to talk about. I may, may take a little crack at it too. So it's again very thoughtful. The CDC recently talked about the use, of, or actually bragged about the use of social media as a communication tool to educate about Ebola. However, it seems that it may have had the adverse effect, and many false claims have been spread through social media. What's your advice and take on the importance of global communications via social media? How can we ensure that proper information is being put out publicly? So I'll ask anybody on our panel who wants to talk about that, and then I'll, I'll throw in my two cents. So, okay, so um, I'll, I'll take an initial crack at it, which is, it really is the, the question that I think we face not just for Ebola, but for information uh, around the world now. But social media is extraordinarily powerful. It's a great way, essentially, to reach out to people. In certain demographics, it is the way to reach out to people. I'm actually on Twitter uh, now, for example. I haven't tweeted this tonight, but I'm on Twitter. Um, because that, I found, and maybe it's going to be Instagram in a few months, but that was the best way to reach out to my students uh, if I want to communicate with them. And that's very important. But the question is the issue around trusted source. So is the information reliable? and who's a trusted source. So I would go back uh, to what, your, what Dr. Eisenstein was talking about. I think there are some fairly trusted sources in this range. I would consider the Center for the Disease, Disease Control to be a trusted source in this area. They really are people who are expert on this. They really are putting out information, I think, that generally people can rely on. I think once you start to deviate from that, and once you start to get away uh, from people who are talking about science, I think you run the risk. I think all of us, and it's natural, like to gravitate to sites and to places that say things that we like to hear, that view the world in the way we like to view them. That's natural. But I think when it comes to things like news, when it comes to things like critical information around health, it really is important to people who don't necessarily have a political agenda, but who really should be putting out primarily facts. So I think, again, you have to rely on some trusted source. I would hope the hospitals here are trusted source. I would hope that the universities generally are pretty trusted sources. But certainly when it comes to disease, I think CDC, WHO, these are sources, I think, primarily of facts. Uh, and they'll really tell you what they know. Someone asked a very good question uh, also about what are facts about what now we always talk about science as a, as a pursuit, really not just a, a pursuit of facts, uh, but really as, a, as an approach to finding facts about things. And so things can always change, and things can change incrementally. So what are the things we think are facts now about Ebola that we're going to discover later may not have been facts? And I think it's a great question. I don't have the answer to that particular question. Ruben, you may want to tackle at this point in time. But, but I think that is the challenge in an evolving epidemic. We do learn more, and things change. And so what's said by CDC at one point in time could possibly change later. I think we have to be prepared for that as epidemics evolve. But in general, I consider those type of sources Ruben, did you want to chime in? Well, there's, there's a vigilance about what's happening in the social media as well. On, on three occasions, it was brought to our attention in, in some of the popular media that uh, Stony Brook had of all the patients who were keeping it a secret, and uh, that entire floors of the hospital had been closed down. Uh, one member of our team had been contacted by uh, the parent. Uh, she was in the back of the school group. The parents came up and said, we've heard this rumor. So, so the fact that people act in a void or sometimes get skewed information is something we have to be alert to and proactively be out there and, and anticipate and be in a position to refute. This goes back to something we talked earlier about 
controlling the narrative so that people are getting the right information and you don't wait to have the correct incorrect information. Any other comments on this point? Yeah, Dr. Rosenfeld? Yeah, I would just say, you know, there's so many editorials out there and so many people that are paid to write their opinions and we can all formulate opinions on what happened. For example, with the, the nurse who's in Maine, nobody in this room saw the chart. Nobody in this room knows the actual details. We just all have opinions based on what people who also didn't see the chart wrote. And I think that that it's one thing to have a general opinion on, on certain scenarios. I've been asked, uh, you know, being that the responsibility for quarantine is in the local health uh, commissioner or director's hands, I've been asked my opinion on it. And the fact is, I don't know the exact circumstances. I, I'm not going to answer what my opinion is on it. And I think it's really important that we differentiate a fun discussion about how philosophically to handle things versus what the actual facts of each individual circumstance are. And so that's why I, I would second your, your um, vote that people use approved known sources of information such as the CDC. Good. So um, another really good question. Um, are we doing a better prevention job on Ebola uh, than we've done with other diseases, for example, uh, HIV. And did we learn things from the approach to HIV that are applicable here? And so I, I can take a crack and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask others to as well. Um, I think HIV is an extraordinarily challenging disease um, from an infectious disease point of view. Um, the extraordinarily long latency period of that disease, so once you're infected with the virus, it can take years before you have symptoms. Early on in the infection, we really didn't know very much about modes of transmission um, for the virus. It took a while for us to really lead. And by the time we really recognized, there already had been very significant spread of this disease. And at the beginning, we had no molecular tools to allow us to know who was infected or not infected. So we were really behind, I think, uh, really not prepared. So I think some of that knowledge has helped us. But Ebola is a, a very different disease. We're talking about an incubation period of 2 to 21 days. Um, we now have much better diagnostics than we had at the time of HIV in terms of our ability to recognize viral infection much more rapidly through things like the polymerase chain reaction. We can identify people much more rapidly who are infected. So I think we did learn a lot um, from HIV from that point of view. But I also want to point out the viruses are, are really very different, um, both in terms of the kinds of diseases they cause. Uh, their modes of transmission uh, are very different. Uh, they're not the same mode of transmission. And then the fact, as I said before, that there's we've advanced in the technology. I think those lessons, I think, have been helpful. Other comments? Yes. Uh, and really, the only similarity that I can see between uh, HIV and Ebola right now uh, is that uh, so we are screening patients for Ebola uh, when they come to emergency departments and primary care centers. I mean, anyone who's going for health right now is being asked, how do you travel internationally? How do you in these countries? We're, we're looking for a subset of patients who might have Ebola. And as that relates just to HIV, right now it is actually required in the emergency department. Everybody who comes into the emergency department is asked whether they want an HIV test. So we, we are screening populations. Uh, we, we are screening the population. We're asking people uh, if they would like to take the test to see what, whether we can find patients who would not otherwise be identified. Uh, so that's the only thing. Great, great point. Uh, other comments? Anybody else on the panel? Anybody want to add? Yes. Uh, Dr. Yes, I just, uh, just want to make a comment uh, as it relates to hospitals. Uh, you, the HIV presented mid late 80s. And today, the hospital structures are very, very different than they were in the late 80s. There is more communication um, with the Department of Health. Uh, guidance uh, for both the CDC as well as the Department of Health. Are there more guidance documents? Uh, most hospitals have an emergency management structure, which enhances communication, which then leads to developing preparedness based on the events that are occur occurring. So I think the hospital environments today are very different from the late 80s. Um, so I don't think you can compare the two and answer the question, are we um, you know, treating this differently? I just think we're at a different point in time, and hospitals are working to better the health of the communities at this point and are prepared to react to situations that present more so now than ever before. Any other comments? So so two individuals asked, again, uh, I think related to, to my part of the program, 
about the role of, of immune therapy. Immune therapy. So do uh, people who've had Ebola, is their blood essentially something that could be used um, for treatment? And the answer, of course, it, it has been utilized um, in several patients. Um, there are very strong reasons to think it could be effective. Um, we know from other diseases in the past that immune therapy, therapy that used antibodies for people who had disease, could be used to treat people who had disease. We've done things like vaccinating horses, essentially, uh, with particular uh, uh, agents or, or proteins, taking their serum and infusing them into people to provide protection, again, for diseases as well. Something we call passive immunization, that's what it's called. So instead of actively immunizing something, like giving them a vaccine and then letting your own body develop the response, you take the antibodies from somebody or something else and put it into people. Because we know antibodies can neutralize virus. So there's real reasons to think this could be effective. But again, I think until we actually have done trials, uh, you know, which I think could happen, because um, ZMAP really is a form of passive immunization that would reflect something very similar to what's done uh, with taking the serum from somebody who survived. Until we've actually done those kind of studies, it would be difficult to absolutely say whether it's effective or not. Um, let, let's say, you know, but I think, I think it does make sense, um, assuming there are matches, assuming there's serum or screen and all the appropriate things. I, I think it's not, I think it's an intervention that from a practical point of view makes some sense. Anybody want to comment or disagree or all of them are welcome. Okay. So um, another question that, that I think was maybe a little more direct at me was, um, okay, yeah, we're, we're about to the end. I want to save the last one because I think it's great. And, uh, um, with, with just how do bats get Ebola? So that's a really good question. I, I think bats um, seem to harbor uh, a lot of viruses um, that are important. You know, rabies obviously comes to mind, but they're asymptomatic. Nipah, Hendra, there's a whole bunch of viruses out there, some of which you may not be familiar with, with that, in, that bats seem to be the natural host. Um, why they don't develop disease with those viruses, I think, is a, a really interesting question um, that people are studying. Uh, but they tend to be asymptomatic with these. And it's when we come into contact with the bats um, that they're at risk for disease. So how many hundred of millions of years ago, uh, you know, bats or 50 million, whatever that number is, became uh, infected with e uh, Ebola or Marburg, I don't know. But it's probably been existing in bats literally for tens of millions uh, of years without them showing any ill effects. We have viruses that infect us and the viruses that infect people um, that seem to be natural colonizers of us. Again, where we can't see any evidence that we have any symptoms or disease associated with those viruses. So it's the same you can imagine throughout the animal kingdom with those specific viruses. Um, so we'll make this the, the last question um, because I think it, it's important. And um, you know, I, I want to get um, Ms. Adahiru and uh, Dr. Eisenstein and, and others to, to, to talk about this. We talk about a global health policy. And our opening speaker tonight talked about a global health policy. What should we be thinking about in terms of a global health policy? So from your perspective uh, in Sierra Leone, um, from your perspective, Dr. Eisenstein, would you talk a little bit about uh, what the importance of public health? And I'll chime in as well. What should we be thinking about when we think about a global public health policy? experiences with Ebola and the rapid rate of which it has escalated, not just from where it started to other affected areas. In terms of global health policies, we should be really thinking about our interconnectedness and prevention strategies and how grassroots development or the roots of infectious diseases from exactly where they originate, how those cultures, cultural practices can influence or drive policies that have an outcome of prevention. So in cases like Sierra Leone or Liberia or other Ebola-affected countries, how do we use the forces or the energies or the local resources that are available to propagate or to drive change in those little communities that can also eventually prevent the escalation of diseases like that? So global policies in terms of primary prevention and using resources within the initial states of where this uh, infectious diseases outbreak from would be what would be very cardinal at this point. Thank you. Dr. Eisenstein? Mm -hmm. Well, we know historically, and even here just in the 
United States that what's going on around the globe is going to impact us, particularly from a communicable disease um, perspective. We make our annual flu vaccine based on strains that are circulating other places around the world. It takes studying those strains and, and having resources placed around the world in order to be able to protect ourselves. And I think that's the key. In order to protect ourselves here, you make the investment in global health with the benefit of helping the residents around the world and ourselves. There's dual benefit from it. So I think that, you know, it's already precedented. It just has to go beyond influenza, essentially, which is, a, which is of course, a grand simplification. But I think that that's a great example of how the work that we do watching disease and studying disease and preventing disease around the world uh, shows that it can work and, and it can impact us here. And so we need to realize, especially when it comes to communicable disease, that we are not isolated, we will never be isolated, especially in a place like Nassau County with Kennedy Airport on our border. We have how many different languages spoken here in Nassau and Suffolk in New York City. And so the proper thing as humanitarians for around the world, as well as for protecting our own residents, is to invest in that global health, public health infrastructure, and the whole world benefits from it. So, amen. Um, and, um, you know, I, I have very little to add other than to say that I think, you know, that to me there's there's two fundamental principles. One, and, and you've really elucidated them, let me just recast in a slightly different way. One is the infrastructure, as we talked about. And again, we had this epidemic because these were countries, because of war, because of extraordinary poverty, that didn't have a health infrastructure in place and was going to allow them to provide, to respond in a timely manner. So this is the province of the World Bank. This is the province, I think, of, of, of many other components in terms of the effects of poverty. But we can't ignore it because, as I say, that failure of their infrastructure is the reason why we've had cases essentially in the U.S. that is directly connected. So we have to be aware of that, that's number one. The second, I think, is the ability to mobilize more rapid responses. So I, I think, you know, the Cubans, you know, you know, I, I, I said good things about tobacco, and I'm going to say good things about Cuba today. I'm going to get in all sorts of trouble. But the Cubans have a system where physicians who are, are trained in Cuba uh, are asked whether or not they want to volunteer, essentially, uh, for essentially a medical corps. And they can spend up to two years in that medical corps. It's part of their medical training. They are then trained in emergency response medicine. They have been dispatched all over the world to provide help when these kind of outbreaks take place. Um, they receive very specialized training. That's a model we may want to look at emulating in the United States. Our medical students are incredibly interested in international medicine and global health. They really want to be engaged in this kind of thing and maybe developing a similar type of mechanism so we too could provide this kind of help. And it goes beyond physicians, it goes to nursing, it goes to all the ancillary care services. But we should be looking at maybe that type of similar response, as should other countries. But because I think we would have been, if we'd had that type of response system, I think we potentially could have been much more on top of this um, than we were. So I think there's always lessons to be learned. Please join me uh, in thanking our amazing panel. Thank you. Thank you.